Clouds cover on average two-thirds of our globe. But we are still far from really understanding them. Clouds play a tremendous role in the water cycle because all precipitation is formed within them. They not only influence the light which comes in from the sun, but also the infrared energy which is emitted back to space by the Earth's surface. Understanding how clouds form and how they change in a warming climate is one of the most important questions today in atmospheric science. Everybody knows what a cloud is, but how many of you actually have ever wondered how a cloud forms or what do we need for a cloud to form? My name is Maria. And I'm Stefan. And we are both atmospheric scientists at the University of Cologne. Today we are here at the research center in Jülich, and here is our research site, Joyce. And basically all these instruments which we have here at our site help us to better understand how cloud form. And this is exactly the topic we want to explore with you today in this video. If you want to understand how cloud form, we first have to talk about the water vapor. Because if there is no water vapor, there won't be any clouds. So water vapor is an invisible gas but nevertheless plays a tremendous role in climate and weather because it's one of the main actors of the Earth's energy and water cycle. Relative humidity is one of the key measurements in atmospheric sciences for weather forecasting, so it has been measured since the early days of meteorology. Very often actually with instruments like this one, which we call a hygrometer, the measurement principle is that you use the fact that human hair actually changed their length depending on the humidity the air has around them. So here you see the hair and the, for example if it gets drier the hair actually shrink a little bit and if it gets more wet then they actually get longer. And this kind of signal you're amplifying here with this instrument, with this lever and writing on a slowly rotating drum. Relative humidity is a measure how saturated the air is with water vapor. For example, if you are in an environment of 100% relative humidity and you hang out your wet laundry, it just wouldn't dry. But relative humidity doesn't tell you directly how much water vapor is in the air. This also depends on temperature. So what we will first do now is have a look at what is the air composed of and how much water vapor is in a certain volume of air. Natural dry air is composed of two major gases. 78% is nitrogen and 21% is oxygen. The remaining 1% is filled with various trace gases. Some of them are very well known for the greenhouse effect, such as carbon dioxide or methane. The amount of water vapor in the air is quite variable and depends mostly on the air temperature. In a warm environment, for example the tropics, water vapor can occupy up to 3%, while in colder areas you sometimes find less than 0.1% of water vapor. Even if we cannot see it, there is water vapor suspended in the air. If we would condense all the water contained in this cubic meter, we would get such an amount of water. Isn't it crazy? Although water vapor represents a tiny percentage of the atmospheric gases, it is extremely important for our understanding of climate and weather, and of course for the understanding of clouds. Before I just show you the amount of water that we could condense in one cubic meter. But what if now we would condense the complete column up to space? How much water do you think we could have? A hundred grams? One kilo? 10 kilos? One ton? The answer might be surprising. If we integrate the whole column up to space, we would get 10 kilograms of water. Which is exactly the amount of water that I have in this bucket. After pouring these 10 kilograms of water into our one square meter, we get a height of one centimeter. That's the reason why you typically find these units when you want to measure the columnar water vapor amount or also the rainfall that was accumulated during the day. 
Maria has shown you that in Jülich we have only one centimeter of water vapor in the column above. Is this the case everywhere and at every time? So let's look at this nice map, a global map of water vapor animated over two days. And you can see a lot of things, a lot of details in the water vapor field. But most importantly, we have rather high values in the tropics, six times as much as in Germany. So six centimeters and much lower values close to the poles. And you see a lot of action. Water vapor is so important because it transports energy and water in the system. So you see this movement, development at one place uh, and a lot of latitudinal mod, uh, the movement and it determines when and where it rains. The classical way of measuring the water vapor distribution in the atmosphere is by launching such type of device. This is a radio sound and is typically attached to a weather balloon. The radio sound has sensors of temperature, relative humidity and pressure. Weather services are launching this type of radio sound to the atmosphere. And for example, alone in Germany, 16 stations are launching such a radio sound twice a day. Now we will show you how it works. We just prepared the radio sound that Maria just showed you and attached it here to a balloon. That's exactly the setting like weather services around the world are doing it every day. Two, one, go! Goodbye! <laughs> Although weather balloons are providing us with a very good in situ measurements, we only can launch them a couple of times a day. Because we want to have a higher temporal resolution, we are going to try to measure the atmospheric state remotely. And that's why we are using remote sense instruments. We are now the manufacturers of one of our remote sensing instruments, which helps us to measure important cloud properties, even though we might be far away from the clouds where we actually are interested in. So essentially, this instrument you see behind me is a very sensitive version of that one. Exactly, a radio. Although this is such a sensitive receiver that you even can hear the sound of the atmosphere. So while your radio at home receives its signal from a transmitting station, this so-called microwave radiometer receives a signal from the atmosphere. So from gases like oxygen, water vapor, or even cloud droplets. So all these different components transmit actually at very specific frequencies where you have to tune your instrument to. This instrument here listens to 14 different frequencies at the same time. The interaction of electromagnetic radiation with the atmosphere is in fact the key principle of any remote sensing technique. Therefore, let's first have a look into how this interaction actually works. No matter if we talk about X-rays, sunlight, microwave or radio waves, physically these are all electromagnetic waves. For some of these waves our atmosphere is quite transparent, while others are completely blocked. This is illustrated by the black curve. When it is at 100%, it means that all radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere. When it is at 0%, it means that the atmosphere lets all the radiation through. The main characteristic of electromagnetic radiation is its wavelength. In this graph, the wavelengths go from short ones on the left to the longest ones on the right. Let's start at the shortest wavelength. Unhealthy gamma rays and X-rays are fortunately blocked by the atmosphere in its magnetic field. Also, most of the ultraviolet radiation is absorbed by the ozone layer at 10 to 20 kilometers altitude. If we move over to slightly longer wavelengths, to 400 to 700 nanometers, we reach the region we call visible light. Those wavelengths are not absorbed at all by the atmosphere. And that's in fact the reason why we can see the sun. Radiation at wavelengths between 1 micrometer and 1 millimeter is usually called infrared or thermal radiation. The reason why we call them thermal radiation becomes clear when we look at our normal world through an infrared camera. 
In this simple experiment, we gradually heat up a metal wire. At room temperature, in the visible image, the wire is black. But in the infrared image, you can already see its radiation. The more we heat the wire up, the stronger the emission in the infrared becomes. At a certain temperature, you can see the wire in the left image start gleaming in dark red. We have now reached a temperature where the wire emission also contains short wavelengths which our eyes can see. When we further heat the wire up, the emitted light changes from red to orange and yellow. This change in color simply shows that the wire emission contains increasingly shorter wavelengths the more we heat it up. With this simple experiment, we demonstrate a very important physical principle. Each body that has a temperature warmer than zero Kelvin, so that's the lowest absolute temperature, is emitting electromagnetic radiation. I'm emitting, you are emitting, this guy behind the camera is also emitting, this building over there, even clouds in the atmosphere are emitting electromagnetic radiation. Let's go back to our frequency overview. In most of the infrared region, our atmosphere is quite opaque. In the infrared, the main absorber is water vapor, which is also the reason why water vapor is considered by far the most important greenhouse gas. If we leave the infrared region towards longer wavelengths, our atmosphere becomes more transparent again. The wavelengths between millimeters down to a few centimeters are called the microwave region. This is exactly the region where our microwave radiometer is listening to the emissions of the atmosphere. As we saw in the examples before, the reason why we can actually receive a signal from the atmosphere and its components like oxygen, water vapor or cloud droplets is because their temperature is greater than the absolute zero temperature. But actually not only temperature plays a role how strong the signal is that we receive here, it's also the amount of, for example, water vapor or oxygen, which is in the atmosphere that plays a role. Just imagine you want to bring more light into a dark room. So you can either bring a lot of small lamps which have a low brightness, or you bring just one in and increase actually the electric current you put through the lamp, which essentially will lead that the wire inside the lamp is gleaming at a higher temperature and you get more light. So here we see now a time series of one day of the seven channels of the microwave radiometer. And if you look at this measurements, they are different in the seven channels because they receive something different from the atmosphere. The values are generally higher here on the top, but here we have a more peaked structure. And this comes from the clouds. So these channels are more sensitive to clouds and successfully less success, uh, sensitive here. But on the other hand, one sees the stronger rise during daytime in these uh, channels and this comes from water vapor. So one can see that there is different information in the different channels. So we have seen that there is a different response in the seven channels of the radiometer. And with some magic, we can identify the contributions of water vapor and clouds separately. So what you now see here is the time series of the total water vapor amount, ranging from about 13 millimeter up to over 20 during the noon time. But if we now look at measurements at the surface, from a weather station at different altitudes, you see that the highest value in relative humidity is in fact just early in the morning before sunrise and then it reduces until noon. But this is due to the fact that the relative humidity is very strongly depending on temperature, which leads to a minimum during daytime. So you heard a lot about a complicated instrument and water vapor. Now, you can produce a cloud very easily at home. All you need is an empty soda bottle, a little bit of tape and a bicycle pump. We will produce some super saturation 
in this bottle. Well, supersaturation means we have relative humidity larger than 100%. So we will attach the bicycle pump to this bottle and first increase the pressure inside it. And then we will quickly release the pressure from it, which will cause the air to cool down very quickly. And in that way, we will produce some decent supersaturation. You probably are not aware of it, but most of you already made a similar experiment in your daily lives. For example, at a bar, at a birthday party. Every time you open a bottle, the air inside the bottle expands and cools. And there you go. You have your cloud. Cheers. I love my job. If an air parcel is forced to climb over a mountain ridge, the lower pressure at high altitude causes its volume to expand and the temperature of the parcel decreases. The relative humidity rises and cloud droplets form. Or at least that's what we all probably learn at school. Unfortunately, it's often not so simple. Saturation or even supersaturation is not necessarily enough to form clouds. What we need to form a cloud are small, tiny pieces of dirt, or what we call aerosols. If we have enough water vapor in an air parcel, some molecules might occasionally collide and form a first tiny droplet. However, the random thermal motions will cause the droplet to break up again. In order to form a droplet just by colliding water molecules, the supersaturations would have to be much higher than you will ever observe in the real atmosphere. Usually, aerosol particles in the air act as so-called cloud condensation nuclei. The water molecules can adhere to them, and due to molecular forces, the water molecules are now more stably sticking together. The larger the droplet, the easier can other vapor molecules condense onto it and make the droplet grow further. We repeat our experiment with the cloud in a bottle, but now we bring some extra aerosols in the bottle and see what the effect on our cloud is. The water vapor condenses now on the millions of additional aerosol particles. As a result, we see a much denser cloud with many more cloud droplets than before. Aerosols in atmosphere can come from very different sources. For example, from burning fuel, from industry or vehicles. But they can also come from natural sources, like for example sea salt, as you can see here, or dust, or even from bacteria from rotten leaves and pollen. We can monitor the type and amount of aerosols in the atmosphere with another remote sensing instrument. This instrument behind me is a LiDAR that emits pulses to the atmosphere in the infrared. The time that the signal takes to go back and be scattered back to the instrument tells us how far away these aerosols are. And also the strength of the signal is telling us how much aerosols there are in the atmosphere. So here we see a nice color image of one day of LiDAR measurements. So 24 hours, about 14 kilometers high. And the whiter it is, the more light is reflected back into the LiDAR. And in the lowest kilometer, you see an accumulation of white. And in fact, this is aerosol, which is trapped in the atmospheric boundary layer, especially during night. And then during daytime, it's a bit lighter here. And it comes because convection is starting as the surface is heating and the aerosols are lifted. And furthermore, you can see ice clouds appearing in the LiDAR signal rather nicely. So in this video, we have discussed how we can measure cloud formation, but actually clouds also precipitate. In future videos, we will deal with questions like how much water is actually inside a cloud and how does it work that precipitation forms inside clouds? And you may have noticed that we have much more instruments here on our research site, which we didn't talk about yet at all. And this will come in future videos. So hope to see you again then. Stay tuned.